yeah, 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 yeah
you know, Danny Basil, Trevor Redfern, th those guys, I think we had a, a really, really good team. But in, if I wanted to win, it wasn't going to be about me getting 20 a game. It was going to be about me getting those guys who were better than me, um, the ball. So I think coaching has always been in my blood, especially when you're a point guard. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, a after high school, you, you know, you, you have some stints in college where it doesn't work out. You know, I was politely asked to leave from Florida Atlantic. Um, and that was probably one, you know, that w w as you go through that, that was probably one of the best things that happened to me. But, it, you know, there's a level of humility that you have to deal with when you're, you're kicked out of school. So, um, you know, you fast forward, man. And after college, like I said, I, I had really good coaches in college. Um, you know, I, I, again, I've been blessed to have some pretty good guys that I, I can emulate. And after college happened, Pitt Johnstown, you know, my college coach, Coach Rukavina, he said, you know, why don't you stay out here? And, and, you know, again, I wanted to get back to New York. I thought I was missing something. Right. I was missing a fast life. You know, it's what I knew. And he, you know, I, and I think it probably helped me. But, it may, you know, if I didn't go back to New York, I, I probably would have been in a much better situation. And I, and I say that with all due respect because I, I, I've been, um, Allah's blessed me with, with, what, with what he's already given me in terms of coaching in life. So um, you fast forward again. And now I'm with the Gauchos, you know, I, I get back from Pitt Johnstown. I have a real job. I'm doing investment banking at, at, uh, uh, at JP Morgan Chase and 9-11 happens. And at that point, when, after 9-11 happens, my, my team, my specialized investment team was let go. And I went to teach, I had no credentials, but I walked in and uh, it was like, hey, you're a black man. You're going to teach second grade. There's usually never any black male teachers. Right. So no credentials, but that's what I got the job. And what that did was it gave me the autonomy to now be able to coach basketball. And I, I was coaching at St. Raymond's. I was coaching at Monroe Community College. And it, 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 was, it was weird for me because it was two places that I had played and had success at as a player. So now you come full circle and it's like, you know, I'm kind of managing guys. I'm not coaching. But just knowing who, who better to relate with these guys that, and because you've been through it. And uh, then you get the Gauchos. And like I said, I had a, a young group, but they were really talented. I didn't, you know, I didn't know who they were. I just, I was going to coach them and I was going to coach them a certain way. And they allowed me to coach them. So, you know, that, that happened. And a couple of years went by and I um, started doing some camp stuff. And Rob Kennedy, a hoop group was like, I think you're pretty good. Hey, would you want to coach in college? I said, I guess so. He said, um, there's two openings. One at Iona and, you know, the whole staff at Marist. I said, all right. I interviewed and I got the job at Marist. And like I said, I, I just, uh, as you go from there, then you, I'm at Marist for, for a year. And I'm like, I don't like the business of it because I felt I could help more kids in grassroots. So I leave. And that was, I think that's a call new sin, especially for a black assistant coach. When you leave, not when they ask you to leave, but when you leave, Mm. It's one of those things. See, I told you he, he he doesn't want to do this. The work is too hard. He can't do it. And it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with, you know, um, I, I was in a I was in a car accident at Maris and I was rear ended and the car was totaled. And the AD at the time, the AD, I guess maybe he was making jokes. He said, you know, he never asked about me. He said, How's the car? Mm. And when that got back to me, it just was like, you, you, you kidding me? <laughs> right. right. So I go back and now I become the director of the Gauchos. I have a team that I help raise and I'm watching and I'm saying like, you know, you got a kid by the name of Timber Walker, who's a rising sophomore, Jordan Theodore, rising sophomore, Daryl Truck Bryant, rising sophomore, Duran Scott, rising freshman, Chris Fouch, rising sophomore. And you just start to say, man, those guys are pretty good. I, did, did I think they were as good as, as advertised? No. You know, again, I'm, 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 a, I'm an old degenerate coach. Right. So I don't see it. And that group on the two years, I want to say they lost one major tournament in two years. Wow. And they were, they, they, we were crowned the, the, the team of the summer, one of those summers. And I was like, okay. But as I mentioned that group, you have the player of the year in the Big East, Kimball Walker, player of the year in the ACC, um, Duran Scott, all-league Big East guy, Jordan Theodore, all-league Big East guy, Truck Bryant, probably player of the year in, in, in the Colonial Athletic Association, Chris Fouch. 
and was really fortunate to for that team to be good. They were good for that team to be great. I had assistance from Khalid Green and 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 in the, in this planet of Brooklyn because they allowed me to come and have t- and, and take Kevin Phillip and Danny Jennings from Staten Island. Mm-hmm. And it was it was synergy because that's the one thing we didn't have. We didn't have legitimate post guys who, you know, especially with the way we played. So we became good and we went to great because you got now two six eight stud enforcers who can really play who are division one guys, who by the way, Danny goes to West Virginia and Kevin goes to Drexel. Right. Mm-hmm. So on one team you, you're talking about, you know, seven, eight division one guys. And I'm missing like Curtis Loving, I'm missing Snacks, you know, Charles Joseph. I'm right. missing Deb Hill who went to DePaul. So that's no disrespect to them, but that that's kind of what what we had, and um, you have you know tremendous success. I, I actually coached USA basketball under nineteen um, Olympic festival, and was the I think I'm the I think I'm the youngest black head coach and the only AAU black head coach um, to win a gold for whatever that means. But that 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 culminated our summer, mm-hmm. and. I'd taken a job after, you know, after that summer, I, I, I'd taken a job with Xavier and, 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 uh, and the rest, uh, you know, as, as we go, we get now, you know, we fast forward and, you know, dealing with the scheme and now this. <laughs> right. Right. What, uh, what made you go back to assistant coaching? Cause you had left Marist. Who, who was the head coach at Marist when you were there? Matt Brady. Okay. Matt. Awesome. And, then, and then you, so you leave. And you you go to the Gauchos have great success. What what made you go back to college coaching? Um, the fact of the matter that I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have you know medical insurance. I you know that that was something that especially you know growing up in so many boroughs and so, so many different places. Um, I just thought about survival. I didn't necessarily think about what it took to survive. I just thought about surviving. So um, you know coaching college basketball gave me an opportunity to do more than survive, give me an opportunity to take care of, of, of my family and myself and, and, and be able to say, hey, you know what? You are going, you know, crazy trying to keep a program that there, you know, there is it's, it's no rules. You know, if, if, if a kid travels with you one day, he comes back, he can travel with Khalid. Like, there's no rules. You know, only right. thing we do is call one another, but what are you going to do, say he can't play? Yes, she right, can't right. play. So, you know, it was one of those things where it, it was out of necessity and it was out of progression because that's what, you know, everyone told me that's what the progression was. I, I didn't know what the progression was. I, I didn't know any assistant coaches. And actually, sorry, Tony Childs and, and, and Chucky Martin, you know, th- those are two guys that, that are like my big brothers in this game. But I, I didn't know, you know, I, I just was like, yo, I'm a, they, they're telling me I'm good. I guess I'm good. I, I didn't know. Right. So, so then you, so then you, you went on, had great success with Xavier. We know that. Um, I'm going to say it for you. At Arizona, they don't even get any near the success of, that they had without you bringing in those players. I remember you had Kevin Perron and and uh, even Momo, right? Mm-hmm. Momo, Kev. right? Well, you, you recruited Rondé, who was with the Nets. So, yeah. um, so... After that, we go, we get to where we are now. Not trying to skip over, but we get to where we are now. And um, I looked at a stat that my brother sent me, and it said that the majority of assistant coaches. What is it? The, the number of assistant coaches in the in college is fifty six percent are black, and only twenty four percent out of two thousand eighteen uh, are black head coaches. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So obviously that was your goal while you were there. Um, talk about, you know, how you might have had some obstacles to get to becoming a head coach before even the scandal happened. So even trying to be a head coach, you know, if, if, if you're not viewed as that, it doesn't matter what you do. Someone else has to make you a head coach. Mm-hmm. And especially when, you know, hey, when you get labeled a recruiter, because I never raised my hand and said, hey, I'm the recruiter. I never said that. Right. I just, hey, I'm going to do my job. And I thought that there was no agent that I could get that could help me become a head coach other than my boss because he knows me. He, he knows my strengths. He knows my weaknesses. So, you know, what, you, what, 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 
what you always fail to realize as an AAU guy, right? You're coming in, oh, he just gets kids. He's a body snatcher. He's just recruiting. And they never give you the credit for, man, that guy's pretty smart. Man, he knows what he's talking about. Man, he can get a guy better. It's you just get players. And then it's like, that's the hardest thing to do, right. to get one player, to get right. one win. Right. right. Like, if, if it was so simple, everyone would do it. But what you do is to become a head coach, um, you have to dress a certain way. You got to look a certain way, right? You don't, you know, hey, there's no heavy head coaches. So it's like, oh, man, I got to lose weight. And, and, and you just start to say, like, as, I, as you buy into all of that, you know, I, I get it. You know, you're, you're, you are the CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation. And they want you to look a certain way. And that, that's extremely fair. But think of this. Most of the times, you know, they say the minority spot. So if I'm on, if I'm on the bench, am I, am I the, the token black guy? Okay, well, no, book, you're not the token. We're not saying that. Well, then what am I? If this is the minority position. Right. So that means you're only hiring me because I'm the minority? Okay. So now, you know, as you fight that, no, it's not that. It's not that. You know, you, you start to fight. Hey, well, these these meetings that are being had with with everyone else but you. Oh, that's not true. That's not true. So what happens? Who do you bond to? You bond to the kids. And mm -hmm. now, guess what? Well, hey, he doesn't. You know, he he's a recruiter. And and that's I don't think there's anyone that's ever gone into college basketball or anything and say, hey, I'm the recruiting coach. Right. Knowing knowing that's what gets the most attention and. Again, I'm, you know, you do your best to be a team player, but there's a level of envy. There's, there, there's, there's a level of envy because your relationships um, where you, you know, the majority of, of, of the African American, um, the, the majority of, of African American coaches, you know, they, they can compete. I mean, they, they can actually um, relate to those, those kids, right? I, I remember having a conversation with, with, with the coach you know, who, who's a, a white assistant coach. And I said, you know, hey, if you're recruiting a kid, you, you, you should try to just see, you know, what they're talking about when they, when they talk about the movie Straight Outta Compton. Right. right. And that coach was like, well, I'm not going to really deal with popular culture with them. And I said, well, you're not going to get the kid. Right. right. It can't always be basketball. I'm going to help you get better at basketball. You're telling a McDonald's All-American you're going to help him get better. Right. Right. <laughs> right. We did a great job of identifying talent. You know, you do a great job of identifying talent, you know, and, and I'm not saying we didn't, at, at Arizona, we did not develop guys because I think we did an awesome job. I think Sean does an awesome job. I think our staff did an awesome job of, of developing guys. You know, we talked about our style of play. But, you know, you start, you know, plugging in Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Stanley Johnson, you know, Derek Williams, Larry Marketing, Aaron Gordon, you know, Brandon Ashley, Grant Jarrett. Caleb Tarzuski, TJ McConnell. Right. Guys are pretty, and, and TJ's the only one off the cusp, but everyone else I mentioned was a McDonald's All American or, 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 or borderline. Right. So, you know, I, and, I, and I try not to discredit, but I just say, you know, as an assistant coach, sometimes, you know, when, 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 when you've been someplace for a long time, they think, oh, man, well, you know, that, that's what he wants it to be. And it's like, you, you don't know, you know, because you're loyal, like my loyalty would get in the way. Like, hey, no, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm loyal to him, you know, to hell with this program. I'm loyal to him, and he's going to let me know when I'm ready. I grew up watching Dean Smith. I grew up watching what happened with the assistant coach at, at, at Carolina. And right. Dean Smith, same thing with Louisville, you know. Coach Patino tells them he's going to get him a job, and, and that's it. You give, me, you give me the time, and I'm going to give you everything, and, you know, then you're going to be a head coach. And, right. and here's the kicker. I'm sorry, Jamal. This, I just had to say this. Then, you, you know, let's say you're making 300 grand. Let's say you're making 500 grand, right? That's the most money that, man, legitimately I'm making. And then you go take a head coaching job at 300 grand. So you're saying, I'm going to now take a step back because the jobs that I get as a black, head, as a black assistant to be a head coach aren't on par with what my white counterparts get. Right. Right. So when we talk about systematic oppression, systematic racism, I don't mean to bring that in, but, you know, wh why is this happening? No, I mean, that's, that's a huge part of it, the systematic racism. I mean, you, you're talking about, uh, you know, recruiting and how they try to downplay it. But isn't that, isn't recruiting, that's like the most important job. Like you say, in terms of getting to know the players, nurturing the players, uh, helping them to, to become better players and people. That's what a recruiter kind of does. You have a relationship with the players. So it's funny how uh, they try to, and, and 
the talent is the most important thing in the game, period. period. We all know that. Period. So, so it's we almost all, like the, if you're doing the recruiting, you're doing, um, you're doing like a bunch of the most important things. You know what I'm saying? But let me ask you, so let me ask you this. So is it, is it a situation where it's set up from the start? Like when they, when they hired you, did you get the feeling that, okay, we're going, he's just going to be the recruiting guy. Cause he, he came from the AAU background. He knows the players. He's just going to be the recruiting guy. Did you, were you in a situation where other assistants kind of were nurtured differently? Like, Oh, let me show you what I'm thinking about offensively or defensively, or is there a difference? I, I didn't, I, I just got the last of, of your question. You kind of froze on me. Okay. I'm saying now we're talking about, you know, systematic, oppression in, in this in this context of of assistant coaches right and I'm wondering when they first brought you in did they designate you not not by saying it but did they basically say you know he's the recruiting guy you know because he he can he can relate to the players he came from an AAU background and do you feel like other like you know white assistants or whatever are are treated differently by the head coach in terms of you know, hey, let's talk about the game plan or, hey, let's yeah. talk about offensive defense. When, when, you know, I think sometimes I, I can speak for me when I came into Xavier. Um, Sean did, did the best job of trying to um, assimilate me with everyone. Um, and, I, and I think my, the staff there, Chris Mack, James Whitford, um, I think they tried their best to help me. But I also know, like, they wanted to be head coaches. And now you're bringing a guy in who's, uh, you know, he's, he's a New York City guy. He's got the ties with, with these AAU programs. So w w was, there, was there some animosity? I, I would hope there wasn't, but it's human nature. You know, what do we need him for? Did they ever say it to me? No. You know, did they ever make me feel that way? Nah. But I, I would just say um, in, in, in some of the conversations, it was, you know, I, I wasn't involved in them. And, and like I said, maybe I needed to be a little bit more assertive or maybe I didn't, but I always felt that, um, and, and I just always felt like because of the relationships you have with the players, they kind of look at you like, you know, well, you just better be careful. Don't get too close to them. And it's like, what, what are you talking about? I'm, like these kids look like me. They, I've been through what they've gone through. Like I understand when they're hungry because I, I've eaten the same things. And I'm, hell, I'm hungry now. So um, I, I never tried to separate that. And, and I think, you know, part of that, you, you do run into the problem of, well, hey, go get the players and, 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 you get the players and I'll coach them up. You go, you know, you go get the talent and, and I'm a nurture and, 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 and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a get everything out, out this talent. And it's like, really? Okay. But after a while, a kid, a kid never cares what you know. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care what you know. You know, he just wants to know how much you care. That, that's it. Right. And it can't, oh, it can't always be basketball. You know, check on them. Again, popular culture. Hey, you know what? Straight out of Compton, man. When that was out, I was in college, man. I thought that was crazy, man. I saw these guys going crazy. Imagine if you said that to a kid, right? Even if it was like, hey, man, I didn't even understand the movement, man. That dude, Ice Cube, is still around. Like th those are the things where now it's not even about being in the know, but you're just sharing some of your your experience. It can't be, hey, come over to my house, have dinner with my family. That kid is looking like he. The kid is just looking for acceptance, but he's gonna come over, and then he's like, he's awkward, right? Right. I'm not saying you got to, you know, you, you got to put on a uh, pop smoke, God rest his soul. But I'm, not saying, <laughs> but part of it is that there has to be a level of, you know, this kid feeling comfortable because he, he is on your campus. And I've always said this, especially with the younger guys, they're trying their best to figure things out. So they're going to say what, exactly what they want you, what, you know, what, what you want to hear. They're not going to be honest with you, especially if they don't know you. Right. Right. It, it, this is a, 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 a conversation that I kind of can identify with because even in the league, um, when I worked in the league as a scout, they tried to pigeonhole brothers to be, once you're a scout, it's hard breaking out of that scout role. It's very hard breaking out of that scout role unless you have um, a made man in the game that can navigate you through the system. And, and so I, I can identify with what Book says. Also identify with the fact that I was on the phone with, uh, um, uh, when I was writing my book, um, my brother, I'm gonna, not gonna say his name, but he's a pro scout. And um, they moved him from, he used to do player development on a particular NBA team. 
And because he got close with the players, he said that he ran into a lot of jealousy and envy from people in basketball operations, which you would think that because that's the role that he was doing. He was doing his job to nurture relationships with these kids, but they got envious with how the relationships grew and you know they backed him off <laughs> that role and put him back in pro scouting right so it's almost, it's almost like uh you know they view it as the labor um and they and they're almost like you know you're not even really supposed to get too close to them probably because they can't they can't get as close because they're not either they're not willing or they just can't they don't have the capacity to speak on that same level. Um, You're no longer yeah. necessary. What, what happens is they don't know, can they trust you? Because guess what? You, you're, you're now, you see it from a different angle, right? I, if a kid is right, he's right. I, I, I would get this all the time. The kids would say, Unc, when you're mad, then, then we know we're in trouble. Because a lot of the times, if we lost the game and we didn't play the right way, Every, everyone would take the tone of the head coach. And it's like, that's not life. Right, right. Right. I don't know why he's mad. And by the way, if I, even if I do know he's mad, we don't have a universal brain. Right. Again, how, how he handles something versus how I handle it makes us unique. But if the kid is saying, I can't talk to you because we lost, then how, how do you ever teach? Right, right. And it, it, I'm telling you, it was one of those most, it was the disheartening thing. And, and, and I, I had kids just always say like, you know, hey, Unc, man, well, you know, what's the temperature today? I said, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Right. You know, I, I'm going to coach you today as, as, as if there was nothing that happened. I, I can watch film that, I, I can watch film of you, you know, making 50 mistakes. That gives me, that gives me 50 things to correct. I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. Right. Khalid, Khalid just mentioned the stats, right? The 50, uh, 50 and I, I wrote, you know, I wrote an article, uh, you know, for the ESPN, the undefeated, talking about, you know, when the whole scheme thing went down. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll get to that. But but it was like, you know, to me, it was obvious scapegoating of uh, of black assistant coaches. And so when I started to write that, you know, I was looking, I was I started to look at the statistics and I was expecting to see uh, even let, you know, I didn't know that that per- the percentage of black assistant coaches would be so high. I thought it was going to be low, kind of like the head coach was. But when I saw 50%, 56% of assistant coaches were black, I was like, wow. You know what I'm saying? They, they're giving them those jobs, right? And then so when you look at and, – and every assistant coach, I would think their, their goal is to become a head coach for the most part, I would assume. And then so when you see only 24% – of head coaches, half of what assistant coaches are, you know, there's a problem there. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you, like, is there anything black coach, like a black coach who becomes an assistant coach, is there any advice you have, any way to go about it to, to in order to make, to give you a better chance to become a head coach? Yeah, I, I think you have to have, you have to have people who are pushing for you. You have to have people on the outside, whether it be media, whether it be social media, who, you know, who, who acknowledge what you do. And, it's the, and, and don't always make it about recruiting because the recruiting is going to kind of be understood. But they got, you know, you got to be able to have intelligent conversations about, you know, how we defend in the back door, you know, how, how we defend in this, this flare screen, you know, how we defend in this away screen. You got to have, be able to have basketball conversations because everyone else just, they may see you on television on the bench and they, you know, you know, and, and, and if you don't grandstand, right, if you're not the guy that's up, you know, pointing and being demonstrative, right, right, right. no one's going to know. And when we do that, it, it's, you know, you show, you're, you're grandstanding, well, sit down. But, <laughs> but, but when they right. do it, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, oh man, they're intense. We're all intense. Passionate, right. Yeah, they're passionate. They, are they more passionate? No. So, you know, I, I just think, especially with the young, you know, with, with the black assistant coach or assistant coach in general, but, but definitely the black assistant coach, man, um, have, having guys that you can talk to, having mentors, you know, that you can talk to who, who, who are coaches, or, or who coach. I think a lot of the times, you know, it's that disconnect. I don't need him. Like, froze a little. Why would I talk the book? That's the dude. But in, in, in my, you know, in my um, career, just in terms of my numbers, I really don't have a lot, of, you know, I don't have a lot of peers in my group just based on, based on performance, based on what, what's been done. So, you know, I, I'm, I'd always say to, you know, to, to a young aspiring coach, like, look, man, 
here's, here, here's some things that make sense. Here's some things that don't. And don't put yourself in this situation. You know, make sure you're doing this. But I, I think we don't, I, I don't think we reach out enough to say, hey, how does this look? You know, man, I'm recruiting a kid and he, and, and, and he asked for money. What would you do? Right. And you know he needs it. And that, and that's, I think, part of it. That's your conversation. Like, hey, man, did, did you promise him? You know, again, if I, hey, Jamal, if I promised you in, in the home visit that I was going to take care of your son, and then when he gets on campus and he tells me, he tells you, hey, Dad, you know, that dude book, man, he told me he's going to take care of me. Uh, you know, he said he wasn't going to buy me a car, but what he did say, he's going to make sure I never ate. But now he's telling me that's NCAA rule that he can't feed me. Jamal, you're going to be like, all right. Right. Because right. we, we also wonder why, why, why the transfer rates are high. Because guys aren't transparent and honest. They tell you one thing and then you get on campus. Hey, I'm telling you, you're going to play 25 minutes a game. What, coach, you sure? Yeah. And then we put it on a kill. He wasn't that good. You shouldn't have told him that. Right, right. So you do anything hey, you're to get start. him. Right, you do anything to get him. Yeah. But then you now you got to do everything on campus. To... Mm. You got to do everything to keep him. And I think with any relationship that you foster, I think you have to maintain it. And, and part of that, you know, part of you maintaining a relationship is how do you keep it? How, how do you grow it? Right. right. Or is it on to the next one each year on to the next one? Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, you reference it, the scheme, the FBI, uh, NCAA recruiting scandal investigation. Um, you know, they went into it talking about they were going to find the deep underbelly, issues of, of, of college basketball recruiting. But when they came out of it, you know, all they had was indictments of, 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 I think it was nine or 10 total, but seven, seven of the nine were of black, either a black assistant coaches or black runners for, for, you know, Adidas or whatever. Um, and you, ended, I think you ended up pleading guilty, right? Pled out. You pled out. Go ahead played out and it was it was weird because you wanted to go to trial and what i realized again I, i've never been in the you know in the in the justice system you know i'm department of justice fbi southern district of new york you know that's the most powerful office in the in the world right so my co-defendant tony bland pleads out and it's like now what do you do right I mean, so, what did you, when they first came at you, I mean, had to, I would think it had to be a shock because, you know, I mean, this, you, you just doing what. Ne, ne, here's <laughs> the thing. When they came in at six in the morning with battering rams. That's how they and, did it? Yeah. Six in the morning, battering rams. You know, my kids are there and it's always the shock factor, right? I'm, I want to scare you up. But again, you're scaring a guy that's 44 years old, who's never been incarcerated in his life. Who's again, who's made it. Out, out, out of the, you know, out of the underbelly for, um, you know, out of the underbelly of, of, of the city. And, and, and you're now saying, Hey, it's the FBI. And, and I'm saying like, I'm a college coach. Right. So now as, as this happens and, and, you know, the way you get treated, is just like, really, really, you know? So I think overall that as, 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 like I said, it affects you. You know, just I don't think anyone understands the trauma, you know, like to this day, it's, it was three years on three year anniversary of me being arrested, you know, on Sunday. I was a mess. I was in tears. I was hurt. I was crying. I, you know, I, I don't wake up. Both, I don't wake up past 6 a.m. ever in fear that at least I'll be ready if they come this time. Wow. All right. And that's for. I mean, and, and, and not to get political. <laughs> but then you look at the, our president who <laughs> has been robbing the American country blind with taxes for all these years. And it, it, it just shows the, the racial disparity, you know, when it comes to all types of all industries and everything in life, you know, so I know I, 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 me and you both have had, had talks and, you know, uh, I know you've expressed, you know, depression and, you know, I, I really felt that man, because, you know, I, when I see you, I see a brother that like the whole city should be embracing. I mean that from my heart because of what you mean to us. So, you know, when you, you the other day you put out a little post about, you know, depression is real basically. And I was like, 
wow, you know, people don't understand all of the residue that comes from going through the trials and tribulations that, that you've gone through, you know, so. In a 36 month span, you know, you lose everything. You, you lose your family, you lose your wife, you lose your career. Um, and, and it spirals, it's, it's this downward spiral of guess what? I, I already felt less than before this even started, but I was able to be, I was able to maintain it because I'm around people, I'm helping. But now when you truly have to deal with yourself and, you, and, and, and you're like, wow, this is, I feel this way, you, you know, this I'm d battling deep depression um, because you feel like you're not, you're not good enough. You feel like you never were good enough. You know, I always talk about, you know, my mom had me at 15 years old and she gave me everything she could give me, but she was still a 15 year old little girl. Right. So in those issues that I had, I couldn't address. And I didn't think, uh, I, I didn't think you, you shared them with anyone. I just thought that was normal, you know, a standard operating procedure. Hey, you know what? I got, you know, I got my ass beat today. Guess what? You know, Hey, I'm in the tub and you know, it's the extension cord that, that wasn't abuse. Like, but, but now at, at 47, I would never do that to my kids because, because I do know. Right. And at that time, you got a single parent trying to raise a boy in the jungle. Right. It's not the easiest thing to do. And, you know, when you, when I talk about that depression, it, it's something that, 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 that hits home because I thought that I was less than, I thought that I was weak. You know, I thought that you're not supposed to do that. I thought, um, you know, when, when, when you start telling people how you are, they start judging you. And, and right now, quite frankly, I, I could care less who judges me. Um, I, I, it, you know, you, you, you deal with so much stuff, especially, and I'm just talking about in the 36 months span, right. let alone the 47 years I've been on this earth. Right. And let's say the third, you know, the 44, 45 years that, that I remember, you know, maybe, for, you know, maybe the 40, 39, 40 years that I remember. And, and like I said, they weren't all pleasant thoughts. Right. So now, you know, like I said, my, my, my gift, that, that God has given me is, is, as I think I'm really good with people and I'm understanding, but I've always said this, who helps that person that's always taken on everyone's responsibility. So, you know, that word depression, you know, means so much because it's real. And at, I, I thought I was weak to say that I'm, I'm severely depressed and, you know, Hey, hey book, you know, I thought you, I think you're a strong guy. Well, you don't, you don't know me, you know, right. because again, part of it, I'm pretending. I don't want anyone to see me cry. I don't want anyone to see me sad. I don't want anyone to see me um, not where I think that I should be in perception. You know, I still want people to perceive that I'm, you know, I, I'm okay. Right. But now I'm like, you know, Jamal, I'm, I'm doing that for what? That person. Think he's froze? Mm-hmm. See if he come back here. If I see myself, then they can kick rocks. So, well, I mean, I mean, it had to be crazy. You know, you talk about the 36 months. I mean, like you said, the FBI breaks down your door. You're an assistant coach. You basically made it out. Like like you're saying, you're doing something, you're doing something very productive, uh, working with kids. Uh, you're you're doing what you, what basically your job description is: recruiting, doing what what any assistant coach would do. Meanwhile, um, you know the head. So you get you get charged. You get you have to plead guilty. Seven of the nine people convicted or or, or who pleaded guilty in this whole scandal were black. Um, meanwhile, the head coaches that you work for um, still. St still have have jobs. <laughs> they still they still coaching. They they're on uh, FBI wiretaps and all that. Um, you ha did did you feel scapegoated from from day one? From day one, I didn't Jamal. I I didn't know what it was, you know, because I still I was still trying to figure out what crime did I commit. You know, when the FBI is involved, it's like what crime did you commit? And even when they started talking white collar crime, I'm like, well, let me know what I did. I okay, you, you know, th this is what I did. I didn't, I didn't see who I bribed. I, I also didn't see who I harmed. And after this thing happens, you know, the more information that you get, yeah, you know, you feel scapegoated, you feel railroaded. And, and you just start to ask yourself, when the FBI shows up, they're not there for, for, for fun. They're there to ruin your life. <laughs> right. right. It's, 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 you know, to go to jail, right? Because I've heard, man, book, you went to jail for 90 days. You know, how, man, that's nothing. 
to a guy that spent, spent his whole life not in jail, the shock of going to jail at 44, the shock of everything being public, the shock of everything that falls, I mean, like tumbling all over you, the shock of trying to just keep it together. So, you know, as, as you go through the, as you go through this stuff, this transformation, you, you wonder like, what did I do? Because you're still right. saying, obviously I had to do something, right? That they, the United States government, they're not just going to pick on me. So it's like, man, wow. am I? Oh. But they and did. It, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. Because really what I, they did, even, even the law, even what they charged you with was basically something that they made up. You know what I'm saying? They, that, that, that law had never been, like people had never been thrown in jail doing the exact same thing before. They had to create a scenario where, where they're saying that you defrauded the university. <laughs> you know, what? like no one, no one had heard of that, uh, that theory before. So they did, in, in effect, pick on all of y'all. Hey, Buck, J Jamal is a lawyer, so he read the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, that was the thing too. It's like when you, like, we defrauded it's like defrauded. We helped. Right. What are you talking about? The and goal is talent in the in the in the country to the universities. That, that wasn't helping. The, that wasn't helping Book Richardson. Oh yes, it was. How? Right. It wasn't like I had a quota. If you get four McDonald's All Americans, guess what? Oh man, you're going to be a head coach. No. You know what helped me? Winning at the university. That's what helped me. So therefore, you go get the best players to help you win. The more you win, the better you have an opportunity to get another to be a head coach. Right. But by the way, who's paying you? Arizona. So right. if, if you get the best talent and, and you guys are winning, you're going to be able to get a raise. Oh, so I get it. So I cheated to get better players to up Arizona so I get a raise. Oh, okay. But I defunded you, okay? Because right. I always say this, man. No kid was ever hurt. Right. You, when you say who was hurt, the black assistant coaches were hurt. Okay. I'll never coach coaches. college again. I don't have a job. It's been three years. I have no, again, like, I, I can keep saying what I don't have. And by the way, what I, I know what I do have. I'm, I'm fully functional, um, college graduated, black man, proud, strong, um, and, and who wants, who, who's, who's looking for another chance. It's been 36 months. So when, when you say that, you know, again, I, I always just, I cringe because it's like, okay, right? I, I, pay, I pay my debt to society. I pay my punk ass 90 days, right, man? So, so now what? And here, here's what you do. Now you give me two years of probation. Right. Has anybody, has anybody reached out to you? Like, like coaches you coached under all that? Lorenzo Roma reached out. You know, Damon Stoudemire, um, Ash Howard, Jeff Arnold. You know, to name a few. It's just, you know, part of it is, you know, a couple of guys like Conzo Martin said, hey, you know, Book, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I, I should have been there for you. And it's like, you know, as sincere as, as sincere as I know those guys are, you know, I needed that a year and a half ago as I was really going through this thing. You know, again, I contemplated suicide on multiple occasions because I wanted this pain to stop. And I figured if, if, if I died, then guess what? My, my secrets would die with me. What, um, now that you're back with the Gauchos, um, how do you, like, I, I had a conversation with you and I said, um, I also doubt college, but I, I can see the NBA. Like, I, I, I see that because, and I'm only saying that book because I've seen a lot of people <laughs> in, in working in the NBA under the guise that they're scouts now, and but they have they have their secrets with them too. So, do you see that as a possibility? You shook you shook your hand no, but you know what do you what do you think? I don't. You know, I I don't know what my band will be. I don't know what my show calls will be. You know, it might be a lifetime ban from college. And again, it's that's part of the depression of now trying to you know deal with that because everyone's book snap out of it. Snap out of what? Like when it's, it's been taken that abruptly. Um, in the NBA, you know, there's, in, in college, there's 351 Division One teams, and the NBA is 30, and they recycle. Right. And that's truly, really, you know, something with some, someone would have to give me an opportunity. You know, I, I've seen college coaches, you know, talk about Black Lives Matter, and it's like, well, you're right, they do. Hire me. Right. I right. would be the cautionary tale. Right. Right. But, you know, again, I, 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 didn't, I didn't get in trouble for touching a kid. You know, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm not trying to scale it down, but I'm, I'm saying like, 
the truth of the matter, am I, am I just perishable? Am I, am, am I the dude that you just throw away? Because again, I think I still have, I think I add value. I think I, I think I add talent. I think I have talent, but I think I add value to, to a program. And you don't, and you know, you can say, Hey, you know what? We're not, we're not going to let him recruit. He's going to deal with the kids on campus. He's going, once our guys get here, that's going to, you know what? That's going to be their, their mentor slash coach. While we're on the road, he's always home with them. But I just say, like, no, no one wants to do that. The NCAA could have easily said, listen, we're going to hire you, and we're going to put you on enforcement. The United States government, when, when they find you hacked, when they find a hacker, they usually right. hire them. Right. That's true. But there, there's so many things that they, they want me to go away. They, they want me to wither. They want me to die. And I'm telling you, I felt like that at times. Like, why, why don't I just die? Why don't I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I, you know, just put a gun in your mouth and, and, and pull a trigger because – when people look at you, uh, man, you risked your career for twenty thousand dollars. Whether they feel that or, or, or not, they say it. Right. You, you know that you, you, you're you're the famous guy. Now I'm I'm very infamous. I was again doing a job that that no one through the history of the sport has said was wrong. Right. Right. And then and then nope. the people the people you worked under haven't been punished. So how wrong was it? Right. What, what's his name? Uh, Wade still has his job at LSU. We know Sean Miller. Um, Bunch of them. Self was on was self. on tape. Right. Right. I mean, it's like it's like. I mean, it's so. That's what I'm saying. I, f- I feel so exactly what you're obvious. saying. Like it's yeah. just it's just like the ultimate. You know everything everything we're talking about now with all this stuff George Floyd, all this stuff, the yeah. systemic racism. I mean that is the, that, that's the epitome. Yeah. They go in and they just cherry pick some dudes who, who can take the fall for, for basically a billion dollar organization, which is the, the NCAA. So, right. I mean, it's just, I, mean, I just think the, the only thing you can do is keep, keep, telling the, keep telling the story so more people who aren't paying attention to this obvious, these obvious wrongs can hear about it. But it, part of it, Jamal, I, I think you have to say to yourself, as moral, as we look at it as morally wrong, Right. But, you know, again, you talk about a systematic oppression. If I make two, if I make. He froze four and a half billion dollars. I'm not doing nothing wrong. What I, I say this. The head coaches from some of these major universities, they make in excess of five, six, seven million dollars a year. What else could they do in life to, to, to make that type of money? That's number one. Right. Number two, right. if if I can pay you six million dollars a year, what am I? What can I make? Right. Because we never look at college college athletic as business. It's, it's it's a business. It's a free market. But we use this nasty, silly little word called amateurism, and it's, it doesn't exist. Right. And COVID nineteen has showed everyone it doesn't exist. That's right. why you're playing college football right now. Right. With no That's kids on campus. Playing- no kids on campus. We're playing <laughs> they play, college football. They play games. No kids on campus. The, and then the president says the other night on TV, I got the big, what is it, Big Ten yep. back big in 10, order. Pac-12. They're playing football. That's for your politics. Stop it. But go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, when you just look at that, who, who, who is the entertainer? When we go to a movie and, 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 and we see uh, Idris Elba, He's already paid. So we could give him all the bad reviews we want. He's already paid. These kids, this is live entertainment. And I've always said, you know, um, this is the last form of modern slavery. Book, all oh, your extreme. The, the, the entertainers, the workers aren't being paid. Right, right. Not, they're not being paid. They're then being told, we give you a scholarship. We, what do you? So right. let's say 50%, let, let, I don't know the numbers, but let's just say 50% of these kids, would, they would qualify for full financial aid. Then what? Do, do you pay them their market value? Right. right. Because if I'm at a school that sells out for 30 years and they're not there just to, oh, the coach. No, they're there to see the talent. They want to see the coach coach that talent. Right. But right. They, they are there to see the talent. Of course. They're there for the movie. Of course. It's just you have the theater. They want to see the movie. Right. And they want to see that 18 times a year. And it's all, it's, all, it's similar to like even, even the drug, like the marijuana situation where – you know, you're locked up people for, for years and years for, for selling marijuana illegally. Then they make it then they make it illegal. What happens to those people? You know here, eventually, 
they're gonna they're gonna pay they're gonna pay kids something. So what happens to the people that you punished previously for doing for doing Stop what was, what should have been done a long time ago? Sorry. Again, it's it's, it's prohibition. Right. Mm -hmm. But the difference in prohibition, those guys became multimillionaires and they now run the country. Right. Their families run the country. So again, again, what's going to happen to Book Richardson? Hopefully, Book Richardson can become a a library teacher in the middle school. <laughs> because, or he, or he bring gauch the gauchos back to 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 their uh, his, <laughs> to 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 the you know, to the heights they used to be at. And and that and that's what you have to bank on. That you know, uh, I'm the I'm the most overqualified boys director in the country, and I say that with all due respect. But I'm the most overqualified guy. Who again, I'm here every day. You know, and this is this is your gig, and you start to say like, man, this is, th this isn't my my, my part time job. This is what I do. Right, right. You know, as as much as I'd love to bring the gauchos back to prominence, it's 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 going to be tough, and I'm going to do everything I can to to get us there. It's a di it's di different different landscape. Right, totally I gonna, different. I was going to ask you that. So now the new lands the new landscape, is it even possible? Like you said, is it even possible? to have any program dominate like that because of, it's so saturated now? Is it, is it a completely different game? Completely different. And that word saturate, you know, saturation means the most because before when you had to make a team, now if, you, if your son's halfway decent and, he, and you don't like what the one coach is saying to him, you go, well, you'll take him and go make your own team. And the, the, there's this phenomena of middle school travel, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. <laughs> It's, it, you start to say, how does this happen? Well, I'm traveling these young kids once a month in, this, in, 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 the, in the fall, winter. And now, guess what? There's rankings, there's gear. So you are now dealing with a 12-year-old kid and you're telling him he's the best 12-year-old in the country. But on the flip side, as we identify talent, on the flip side, if Justin Bieber, who was who was discovered by Usher, right, one of those guys, mm -hmm. he was allowed to make money at twelve, or his parents were. That's right. Why can't why can't that twelve year old black kid make money? Right. He and that twelve year old black kid has followers and you know Instagram. That's money right there. Name and name and imaging likeness. What, what's right. going to happen? With That's going to change the game. That name and image and likeness is gonna change the game. I just looked on the uh, Instagram the other day and saw Mikey, <laughs> the kid Mikey, has a million followers. <laughs> yeah, it don't matter, don't matter where he go to, to go to school. He can he, he can, he to can go to an HBCU. Right, right, right. People people are gonna find that game because they know millions of people. So that's there. so that's a that's a game changer, and I, I agree with Book man. It's time. To, it's time to pay. pay. Uh, it is. I call it. A, I mean, some people call it a slave game. I call it a pimp game. That's that's what it is. You know, you pimping off of our off, off of our resources um, that you know you would never even be involved with if they didn't have a special talent. Right. So you're leeching onto them, making money off of them. And we have to do a better job. Um, those that us that are, of us that are on the ground of honing our talent and giving these kids the jewels to know what the hell is going on. Cause a lot of times they don't even know what's going on and neither do the parents till it's too late. And even when the parents, cause that, that's the thing too. Now the parents are trying to get involved and they think they know the business structure and, and they don't. Facts. You know, and, and like I said, it's just, it's one of those things, man, as I fight emotion, it's, it, it, it takes you in so many different places because you're just like, I watched the debate the other day and I'm saying, is this what our country comes to? I'm looking at Donald Trump and I'm looking at Joe Biden. I'm saying, these guys are calling each other's clowns. This, this. He <laughs> says, your son's a crackhead. Like, this was an episode from Jerry Springer. Yeah, no question. It's crazy. That was Caucasian ghetto. Yeah. That was if the, it was, that was us, the, the darkest was debate us, ever. If it was us, they call it the hood. Yeah, that's what that was. We, we, that we, was would, we would not get that platform to do that. No. Ever. No. So, Book, where are you going with this? As they have the platform to always tell us what's right, we don't police ourselves to, to say, hey, you know what? There's a kid that's going to this school. 
there's a kid that's going to this school. Well, why do you want that? Because we, we want the balance of power. We don't talk about the commission. Well, book, you keep saying this word, the commission. Yeah, I say the commission because we're, we're strong enough to say no. When you come to New York to recruit, you, you're going to sit with somebody from the member of the families. Right. And if you don't, and if you don't do right, you won't get a kid. You or anybody in your, in, in, you know, in, in your coaching tree. Right. And if you don't, right? If if if, if you say, well, I'm not, I'm not sitting down with y'all. All right, no problem. Right. Turn it, turn the water all the way off. Turn the faucet off. Yep. So is that is that something you can do now from your from your current position? Uh, I, I I don't know I I don't know if if there's five or ten people in. I'm gonna ask him it again. I know you were so, too. What happened? I, lo I, lo I lost. I lost you for like twenty seconds there. I didn't catch the answer. I said part of having that coalition is just like those debates, right? We talk about hey, these night the nineteen ninety four crime bill with with Joe Biden. Why don't we do that with coaches? Hey, in nineteen ninety four, you had these kids <laughs> right. like this, or you, you, the way you recruited was like this. We don't hold coaches accountable. Right. right. Only, only black assistant coaches. Only black assistant and coaches. And for, for something they shouldn't even have been held accountable for. Right. So now, I mean, you know, now the current situation, what, what do you, you know, what does it look like out there in terms of talent? I know you already mentioned the game has changed in terms of parents acting differently, wanting to become more involved. What's the talent like in New York City? Is is it on a, is it on the level? Is it are we lacking? We're, we're talented, you know, young. But I, I would say this: we have to do a better job of keeping the talent here, where we where those guys where we can make sure that they're going to um, graduate and get everything that they need. We also have to do a better job of 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 you know uniting and, and not not even uniting, but just um, coexisting because. The AAU coaches don't like the high school coaches. The high school coaches don't like the AAU coaches. It's silly. And if we, you know, Khalid was a, was a high school coach at Bishop Lachlan. We had the greatest relationship. You know why? Because I respected what he did and I supported what he did. Right. And it wasn't that we got a kid that happened. I, I, that happened before we even got a kid from Lachlan. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to truly help the kid get to where he's supposed to get to. If a kid's a pro and he gets there, you did your job. If a kid's a Division One kid and you did your job, you, you're great. If a kid's a Division Three player and he got to where he was supposed to get to, you did your job. Right. Now right. it's all to the next one. Right. What's more important, AAU right now nowadays, AAU or high school? I think, um, unfortunately, AAU becomes so so important because. AU, I've always equated I've always equated AAU to the NBA. Like when you look at the bubble right now, that's NBA, that's AAU at its finest. That's all it is. <laughs> you play one game a day, every other day. All the teams at the same venue. That's Vegas. That's the super showcase. Yep. But AAU won't get credit for that. Right. It's the it's the AAU is the dirty stepchild that everyone is like. Man, wh why do you treat it like? Why, why do you treat it that way? So AAU and the NBA, they kind of merge. Then high school and college, because of the rules, right? If you transfer in, in high school and you transfer in college, you got to sit out. Right. Well, if you leave a team in, 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 wow. in AAU, you, you can play shit <laughs> maybe next week. Right. You can get, right. Again, there's, you can trade in the NBA. There's no trading in college – or high school, so the the the, over, the overwhelming correlation is we're going to be attracted more to the AAU. It's going to get more. It's, it's going to get more focus. Why? Because you also have a superior talent. You have you know two or three of the best kids on everyone's high school team versus those guys just playing together. Right. So it's easier to navigate in terms of talent. All right. Um... Before before we let you go, 
what what you what do you envision for the gauchos come you know where where would you like to to get them now that they aren't where they that they aren't there yet i I'd love to have more stability i I love for our culture to be a certain way in terms of um buying um right now you know we have situations where um there has been a lot of buy-in and 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 to their defense they didn't you know sometimes when you don't know how something looks it's tough for you to follow and i think especially with our our coaches you know keeping our coaches coaches um stacked meaning keep them as talented as, as, as talented as the coaches are i think you can get talent i think they can help with talented kids yeah. i think having um you know, other than the, 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 the culture here, you know, going to, going to go get some size across the city because I think we can compete at every level. And like I said, just, um, ha, you know, ha, having our guys be able to adapt and adjust to, to what greatness looks like because everyone tells me they want to be great. And I'm like, have you ever been great? Right. Right. Oh, thank you. Emmanuel, I'm gonna put your government out there. <laughs> <laughs> Book Richardson, <laughs> you know I had to get him at something. <laughs> nah, we love we we really appreciate your time, Book. For real. And, and your heartfelt words and your passion and you know we you know I'm rooting for you. No, I know that, and I appreciate you guys, man. And like I said, this is you know ha being able to talk about stuff like depression is is therapeutic because yeah, I, through it, I, I tried to hide and I can't hide anymore. I'm broken. Um, I've lost a lot, um, and I'm going. I'm going to do my best to try to just, you know, be sustain um, any, everything I can and just be normal as best I can. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely, definitely rooting for you. And you, obviously, you got a lot of talent, so I don't doubt that uh, you can do some great things with the Gauchos. Um, okay, the fellas. All right. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. All, right. All right. All right.